This video is 10 months in the making. Hi everyone, Jennifer here and welcome back to The Daily Connoisseur. I am sharing 15 life-changing homemaking secrets that I learned from the Little House on the Prairie book series. Over the past 10 months, I have been reading this series to my older daughters. We learned so much about history and that particular time period, and my daughters and I just absolutely loved it. When the series ended, I felt like I was saying goodbye to a really good friend. Okay, you know me. I love to explore different cultures or different time periods to really study them and to take their secrets and apply them to my everyday life. That's what I did with my Madame Chic books. I went to Paris, I studied the way my French family lived, and I applied the best parts of Paris to my life here in America. And I've done the same thing here with the Little House on the Prairie series. In this video, I'm going to be focusing only on Laura Ingalls and her family. In part two, we're going to be discussing Farmer Boy and the homemaking secrets I derived from that book because that book has so many of its own, it needed its own separate video. So make sure you look out for part two. So without further ado, let's jump into the 15 life-changing homemaking secrets I learned from the Little House books. Homemaking secret number one, routines framed their day. So I have an excerpt here from On the Banks of Plum Creek. It says, in the mornings after the chores and the housework were done, Laura and Mary studied their books. In the afternoons, Ma heard their lessons. Then they might play or sow their seeds till time to meet the herd and bring Spot and her calf home. Then came chores again and supper and the supper dishes and bedtime. So as you can see, just in that paragraph, it framed the entire day. And their day was based off of the chores that they had to do. So chores started first, and we're going to get to that in a uh, separate tip. Uh, then the housework was done, then they studied, then they would play and sew, then they would go out and bring in the animals, then came chores again, and then supper dishes and bedtime. So homemaking routines really did frame their day. Let's look at By the Shores of Silver Lake for more reinforcement. Chapter 10 of By the Shores of Silver Lake, The Wonderful Afternoon, it says, all the days went by one like another. On Mondays, Laura helped Ma do the washing and bring in the clean scented clothes that dried quickly in the wind and sunshine. On Tuesdays, she sprinkled them and helped Ma iron them. On Wednesdays, she did her task of mending and sewing, though she did not like to. In the previous paragraph I read to you, it showed the routine for the entire day. This one focuses on the weekly routine and how it involved the washing and how they would frame their weeks around that. So their days were framed on a smaller level by the daily chores and their weeks were framed by the weekly chores. Let's look at one more excerpt. In By the Shores on Silver Lake, chapter Merry Christmas, it says, Ma dipped the snowy kernels from the kettle into a milk pan and Laura carefully salted them. They popped another kettle full and the pan would hold no more. Then Mary and Laura and Carrie had a plate full of the crispy, crackly, melting soft corn and Pa and Ma and Mr. Boast sat around the pan eating and talking and laughing till chore time and supper time and the time when Pa would play the fiddle. So the reason why I brought that up is because this is a description of their Christmas day. And so even on Christmas day, they kept to their homemaking routines. They didn't take it off. After all of the celebrations, they had chore time. So routines framed their days and weeks and years. Okay, the second homemaking secret is that the housework was done first. So I'm going to read to you from The Long Winter, page 97. There would be no more school till the blizzard was over. So after the housework was done, Laura and Carrie and Mary studied their lessons and then settled down to sew while Ma read to them. So after the housework was done, then they would do school. There are a lot of homeschooling families now with everything that's going on. And so a lot of families, myself included, we start off with school right after breakfast, but maybe we should take a page from The Little House on the Prairie and do a bit of housework first and then school. I don't know, maybe they were onto something. 
life-changing homemaking tip number three is that cleanliness and good grooming was a priority. So I'm going to read to you from On the Banks of Plum Creek, page 296. Pa followed the rope to the stable and back. Ma cooked and cleaned and mended and helped Mary and Laura with their lessons. They did the dishes, made their bed and swept the floors, kept their hands and faces clean and neatly braided their hair. Now what you have to keep in mind is with this is that this happened during a blizzard when they weren't even going to see anybody else. So I think most of us, if we were stuck in a blizzard, might just stay in our jammies all day long, not even brush our hair. But they did all of this. They did their lessons. They did the dishes, the bed, the floors. They kept their hands and faces clean and neatly braided their hair. So there was an emphasis on looking presentable always and, and being well-groomed, even for the children. Now, I always say that how you behave behind closed doors is indicative of how you are everywhere. And if you practice these practices behind closed doors on days when you're never even going to see anybody, you're going to be more comfortable doing this out in public and with others, and it's not going to come across as false. Homemaking secret number four, and this is not really a secret because we all know this as well, but it's exciting to know that they also wore aprons to preserve their clothing. So in By the Shores of Silver Lake on page 216, it says, set the table, Laura, Ma said quietly, tying on her apron. Mrs. Bose put on an apron too, and they were all busy poking up the fire, setting the kettle to boil for tea, making biscuits, frying potatoes, while Mr. Bose talked to the visitors who stood in the way, thawing themselves by the stove. Pa came from the stable with two more men who owned the team. They were homesteaders, going out to settle on the Jim River. So the two women knew that they had a few tasks ahead of them, and what did they do? They both tied on their aprons. So that is some apron wearing inspiration for you. Homemaking secret number five, they adjusted their regular homemaking routine for special occasions. Here we have On the Banks of Plum Creek, page 297. There is a blizzard going on. It says, even though the sunny day was not Monday, Ma washed the clothes and hung them on the clothesline to freeze dry. That day there were no lessons. Laura and Mary and Carrie bundled stiff in thick wraps, could play outdoors in the sunshine. Next day, another blizzard came. So basically they're in between blizzards here. And so in order to take advantage of this, instead of rigidly sticking to their routine and thinking, nope, we do this on Monday, we do this on Tuesday, they took advantage of the sunshine. The girls did not do school that day, even though they were supposed to, and they all went out to play because they knew that another blizzard would be coming soon. So this is another lesson, especially for some homeschooling parents out there, that we don't have to stick to a rigid schedule of we have to do this on this day and we need to be flexible. If something is thrown our way, a curveball, the weather, a special occasion, something out of the blue, we need to be flexible and roll with it and just enjoy the rhythms of life. I have two more examples of this very thing from The Long Winter, page 133. Breakfast was so merry in the warmth and stillness and light that the clock was striking half past eight before they finished, and Ma said, run along girls, this one time I'll do your housework. The whole outdoors was dazzling, sparkling brightly in the bright sunshine. And I also have written down page 147. Pa came and ate the same supper of potatoes and bread with dried applesauce and tea and left the dishes unwashed and went to bed at once to save kerosene and coal. So in the first instance from this book, you see Ma didn't usually do their housework for them. The girls did it on their own, but because it was sunny outside, she allowed them to go out and play and enjoy themselves because they were in a harsh winter. So she ended up doing their housework for them. And in the second instance, Pa did not wash the dishes, he left them unwashed and he went to bed at once to save kerosene and coal. So in this instance, they were saving resources. They were not in the habit of leaving dirty dishes out, but they had to in that situation. And that's something that we homemakers can take as well. I know everybody always says, go to bed with a clean kitchen at night. And yes, that is a good rule and one that I definitely try to live by. But sometimes we're all just so exhausted that we leave the dishes in the sink and that's okay. They even did it back in the pioneer days. Okay, tip number six, 
work comes before pleasure. I'm going to say that again. Work comes before pleasure. I'm going to read to you from The Long Winter here, page 171. They stirred and punched the clothes boiling on the stove. They lifted them on the broom handle into the tub where Ma soaked and rubbed them. Laura rinsed them. Carrie stirred the bluing bag in the second rinse water until it was blue enough. Laura made the boiled starch. And when for the last time, Ma went out into the cold to hang the freezing wash on the line, Pa had come for dinner. Then they washed the dishes, they scrubbed the floor and blackened the stove and washed the inside of the window panes. Ma brought in the frozen dry clothes and they sorted them and sprinkled them and rolled them tightly ready for ironing. Twilight had come. It was too late to read that day and after supper there was no lamplight because they must save the last of the kerosene. Work comes before pleasure, Ma always said. She smiled, her gentle smile for Laura and Carrie and said now, my girls have helped me do a good day's work and they were rewarded. So work comes before pleasure. Before we talk about that, can we talk about the laundry routine? Does that not make you grateful for the washer and dryer that you have, even though my washer is acting up right now, I'm so grateful for it. They had to punch the clothes boiling on the stove, lift them on a broom handle, soak them, rub them, rinse them, blue them, <laughs> second rinse water, boiled starch, hang them out in the freezing cold. If that doesn't make you appreciative for your laundry routine and how simplified it is, I don't know what will. But the point is that Ma said work comes before pleasure. And it says in here that she always said that. So this is a motto that they lived by. And I do believe that if you work hard, then you can play hard, but you have to do the work first in order to enjoy the satisfaction of play. So this is a very good um, example of the strong work ethic that they had during this time period and everybody had it. Tip number seven, they dealt with monotony and hardships with a good attitude and perseverance. So in the long winter, we're kind of in this book, there's a lot of homemaking inspiration in this book. Page 186, for supper, there were hot boiled potatoes and a slice of bread a piece with salt. That was the last baking of bread, but there were still beans in the sack and a few turnips. There was still hot tea with sugar and Grace had her cup of cambric tea made with hot water because there was no more milk. While they were eating, the lamp began to flicker. With all its might, the flame pulled itself up, drawing the last drops of kerosene up the wick. Then it fainted down and desperately tried again. Ma leaned over and blew it out. The dark came in, loud, with the roar and the shrieking of the storm. So I read that part to you to just kind of paint a picture of what's going on here. If you know the series, and I'm not really giving anything away, in the book, The Long Winter, they were caught off guard by the severity of the winter and how early it started, and nobody was really prepared for it. So it gets pretty scary as they start to run out of food. So just imagine that situation right there. So on page 227, it says, it was thoughtful of you, Charles, to lay in such a supply of tea, she said. There was still plenty of tea and there was still sugar for it. For the second meal of the day, she boiled 12 potatoes in their jackets. Little Grace needed only one and the others had two apiece. And Ma insisted that Pa take the extra one. They're not big potatoes, Charles, she argued, and you must keep up your strength. Anyway, eat it to save it. We don't want it, do we, girls? So it goes on to talk about how hungry they were. And there isn't exactly a line here that describes this, but throughout the entire book, you see how they meet this hardship here. Uh, the scary uncertainty of perhaps potentially starving to death. And I can't even imagine what that would be like. We got a little glimpse of that with this past pandemic uh, that happened where there were shortages. And I remember going to the grocery store and seeing hardly anything on the shelves and that's quite scary. So their level of um, fright must have been a lot higher even than ours. And yet throughout the entire book, they displayed fortitude, perseverance, a positive attitude. And I think that that really helped to get this family through this particular crisis. Homemaking tip number eight, they appreciated the small things. We're gonna stay here in the long winter in the chapter on Christmas and it says, Pa bought groceries that afternoon. It was wonderful to see him coming in with armfuls of packages. Wonderful to see a whole sack of white flour, sugar, dried apples, soda crackers, and cheese. The kerosene can was full. 
How happy Laura was to fill the lamp, polish the chimney, and trim the wick. At supper time, the light shone through the clear glass onto the red check tablecloth and the white biscuits, the warmed up potatoes, and the platter of fried salt pork. So she's just talking about basic groceries here, okay? Um, talking about flour, apples, soda crackers, cheese, the type of things that we don't really get that excited about or thankful for. She's talking about the kerosene in the lamp. I mean, for us, that would be light bulbs. I think a lot of us can relate to this right now. When you go through a shortage situation where you are without something for so long, suddenly you appreciate the small things. How many of us appreciate having toilet paper? I know I do. <laughs> I appreciate having toilet paper. I appreciate having a stocked pantry. It's those little things, your perspective shifts. So that is definitely something that we can take away from these books. Tip number nine, they had a priority toward looking presentable always. So in one of the first tips, we talked about good grooming. And I did read you that excerpt from On the Banks of Plum Creek, where it talked about how even in a blizzard, the girls would braid their hair nicely, wash their face, and get dressed. But I'm going to read to you from By the Shores of Silver Lake, page 16, uh, on the chapter called Riding in the Cars. It said, clean and starched and dressed up in the morning of a weekday, they sat in a row on the bench in the waiting room while Ma bought the tickets. So they're going to be traveling by train and they are clean and starched and dressed up, it said. So we are living in a very casual age where people do not dress up to travel anymore, but it was a priority even on a weekday, not even in their Sunday best, they were clean and starched and dressed up. I do believe that that does help homemaking in a very indirect way. Life-changing homemaking secret number 10 was they took immense pride in their work. So on the banks of Plum Creek, page 301, in the chapter called The Long Blizzard, it says, After Laura and Mary had washed and wiped the dishes, swept the floor, made their bed, and dusted, they settled down with their books but the house was so cozy and pretty that Laura kept looking up at it. So they did the house, just like we discussed, they always did the housework first and then they did their lessons, but she couldn't even focus on her lessons because she was admiring the house. Now, isn't that how we want our children to become? We want them to admire a clean space. A lot of times parents can be frustrated and think, why? child are you so messy why don't you care that your environment is so messy i know that that's a frustration that i personally deal with as well as millions of parents right we want our children to enjoy the atmosphere of a clean space but they need to appreciate how to get there first so if mom is just doing all the work and they're just laying back and playing video games they're not going to appreciate what goes into a clean house but the fact that laura and her siblings all partook in the housework, she was then able to appreciate her work and to actually admire it, so much so that she couldn't even focus on her lessons. Homemaking secret number 11, good homemaking makes the home a haven. Let's look at The Long Winter, pages 94 and 95. It was so wonderful to be there, safe at home, sheltered from the winds and the cold, Laura thought that this must be a bit like heaven, where the weary are at rest. She could not imagine that heaven was better than being where she was, slowly growing warm and comfortable, sipping the hot, sweet ginger tea, seeing Ma and Grace and Pa and Carrie and Mary all enjoying their own cups of it and hearing the storm that could not touch them here. So again, she's appreciating the cozy atmosphere of home life and part of that cozy atmosphere is the orderliness and the cleanliness and just the overall warm atmosphere of her life at home. So good homemaking creates a home that is a haven. Life-changing homemaking tip number 12. They looked at homemaking as an enjoyable task. In other words, they had a good attitude toward it. And I'm always saying this, if you have to do it anyway, you might as well have a good attitude toward it. So I have a lot of examples here, and I'm going to read them to you now. The first one comes from By the Shores of Silver Lake, page 220. 
To put things in context here on By the Shores of Silver Lake, Ma and her daughters are serving breakfast for the travelers that are coming through town. So notice how it describes how Laura got out of bed because this was a lot of work for them. They would cook all day long and clean up after uh, these traveling men who were coming through town. It said, in the morning, the traveler's voices and a clatter of dishes woke her, Laura, and she sprang out of bed to dress and hurried downstairs to help Ma. Outdoors was crisp and cold. Sunshine gilded the frosty windows and in the house, everyone was hearty and cheerful. How the travelers did enjoy that breakfast. They praised everything they ate. The biscuits were light and flaky. The fried potatoes were brown and finely hashed. The slices of fat pork were thin and crisp and the gravy was smooth and brown and creamy. There was hot brown sugar syrup and plenty of fragrant steaming tea. So Laura sprang out of bed to go help her mother. Instead of lethargically getting out of bed and whining and complaining, she sprang out of bed. There's a big difference there. She wanted to help her mother and this was exciting for all of them. The next example that shows how enjoyable homemaking can be comes from these happy golden years, page 39. All that day was such a happy time. Laura did her washing and sprinkled and ironed the clean, fresh clothes. Then in the cozy sitting room, she ripped her beautiful brown velvet hat, talking all the time with Ma and Carrie and Grace. She brushed and steamed the velvet and draped it again over the Buckham frame and tried it on. So it talks about how it was a happy time. She did her washing and sprinkled the ironing. So she's describing her washing and ironing routine and sewing routine as a happy time. Again, a good attitude toward homemaking. Final example comes in the first four years in the chapter, the first year. Now was a busy, happy time. Manly was early in the field plowing and Laura was busy all day with cooking, baking, churning, sweeping, washing, ironing, and mending. The washing and ironing were hard for her to do. She was small and slender, but her little hands and wrists were strong and she got it done. Afternoons, she always put on a clean dress and sat in the parlor corner of the front room sewing or knitting on Manley's socks. So again, she's discussing heavy cleaning here, very heavy cleaning cooking, baking, churning, sweeping, washing, ironing, mending, and she describes this as a busy but happy time. So she's looking back fondly at those things. And so when we're met with really heavy duty cleaning, I don't know if we would necessarily look at it as a happy time, but perhaps if we did, we would change our homemaking routine. Homemaking tip number 13, they never measured when they cooked. So you're probably thinking, how is that a homemaking tip? But I'll read my excerpt and then I'll tell you what I think. So this is from By the Shores of Silver Lake. And right now what's happening is that the Reverend Stewart is asking Ma how to cook things because he is going to be off on his own and he has no idea how to cook. She asked him, do you know how to cook, Brother Stewart? Ma asked and he said he expected to learn by experience. He had brought supplies, beans, flour, salt, tea, and salt pork. So she goes on to show him, she says the meat is easy, cut the slices thin. She's telling him to parboil in cold water. When the water boils, pour it off. Then roll the slices in flour and fry them brown. When they are crisp, take them out to a platter and pour some of the fat off. She goes on. So this is a long description on how to cook. And he said, would you mind writing it down? Said Reverend Stewart, how much flour and how much milk? Goodness, said Ma, I never measure, but I guess I can make a stab at it. So. What's the tip here? It's not to never measure what you cook, but the point is, is that she was making her meals on a regular basis. She had a capsule wardrobe of meals, if you would, and she rotated them so much and was so proficient and good at making them that she didn't even know the measurements she used. So that can be a tip for us homemakers. Instead of every time we cook trying to find a new exciting recipe, maybe we could become very proficient at the few recipes that we do have to the point where if somebody asked us what the measurements were, we would have no idea. So it's always good to just master a few things with your homemaking, a few recipes, a few techniques, and then the rest of the time you can experiment with something new. Life-changing homemaking tip number 14 was they monetized their homemaking when they could. So in By the Shores of Silver Lake in the chapter called Building Boom, page 241, 
they have started to take in boarders. So initially they were feeding the travelers that came by, but Ma wanted to earn some more money. And so they decided to charge uh, the people who were traveling through the town to stay with them. And so they started getting a lot of business. And it says, oh Ma, isn't it wonderful all the money we're making? Laura said, sweeping vigorously while Ma gathered another armful of bedding. Draw the broom, Laura, don't flip it. That raises the dust, said Ma. Yes, but we mustn't count chickens before they're hatched. That week, the house filled with steady boarders, men who were building houses in the town site or on their homestead claims. So two things I wanna point out here. Number one, yes, they were monetizing their homemaking. They were able to think about a service that they could provide where they could make money off of it. Now, I know a lot of homemakers feel frustrated because we don't get paid for all the work that we do. But there are so many ways that you can monetize your homemaking these days. You could do a blog, a YouTube channel like I do, for example. You could write about it, uh, or you could even do things like rent out a room. I know a lot of people do that in their home or rent out a portion of their home or use their home to store things for other people, or you could sell items from your home. There are so many ways that people can monetize their homemaking. Other people might make bread or make cookies or make and sell goods at the farmer's market or locally in your neighborhood. There are so many ways, that's an entire video all on its own. But basically, they monetized their homemaking when they could and they were able to do this and earn a lot of money. The second thing I wanted to point out to you was how it said Laura was sweeping vigorously. So again, she was working with gusto, with excitement. She wasn't just, oh, mom, you know, kind of sweeping the floor like a lot of our kids are used to doing, but she was sweeping vigorously. They understood the pleasure that was found in good work and the reward that came from earning money from it. And the final life-changing homemaking lesson that we can learn from the Little House on the Prairie series is that a bad homemaker's attitude can seriously ruin the atmosphere of the home. So in these happy golden years, Laura ends up staying with a different family as she is teaching in another town. And there is a character called Mrs. Brewster who didn't have a very good attitude. Let's read about her. It says, Mrs. Brewster let the housework go. She did not sweep out the snow that Mr. Brewster tracked in. It melted and made puddles with the ashes around the stove. She did not make their bed nor even spread it up. Twice a day she cooked potatoes and salt pork and put them on the table. The rest of the time she sat brooding. She did not even comb her hair and it seemed to Laura that Johnny squalled with temper that whole week. Now we don't know what was really going on with Mrs. Brewster, but if you're familiar with this book, you know there is a lot more to this woman. <laughs> and a lot of crazy things happen with her. But the point is, is that Laura goes from a very happy home, a cozy, warm environment where everyone is cheerful and has a positive attitude, to a home where the homemaker has a very bad and negative attitude and it puts a cloud on the home and you're walking on pins and needles, you feel like you can't relax, you feel like you can't enjoy your home life. So this really convicted me because a lot of the times when I feel angry or overwhelmed or just annoyed or all the feelings that homemakers can feel, I will have a bad attitude about it. And I know I'm not alone. I know that almost everybody watching this video has experienced the same thing. So we can remember that. We can remember that we really do help to set the atmosphere in our own home with our attitude. So Mrs. Brewster might've been going through some depression or some really hard times. And of course there's always grace for that. But we as homemakers can remind ourselves that a positive attitude really does make a world of a difference. So whatever you can do to get out of the funk that you're in, whether it's going outside, having a cup of tea, taking a five minute break, or just keeping your mouth zipped when you really wanna be saucy and talk back to everybody, whatever works for you is the best way to go forward. Now that was the final tip, and I don't want you to leave this thinking, wow, these people were perfect, and they love sweeping their floor, and they love doing the washing three days in a row. I don't want you to leave there because they were just like us and Laura got burnt out on homemaking too. So in the first four years, which is the last book in the series, she went through a very difficult time and it said, um, this is on page 117, it says, 
How could she ever keep up the daily work and still go through what was ahead? There was so much to be done and only herself to do it. She hated the farm and the stock and the smelly lambs and the cooking of food and the dirty dishes. Oh, she hated it all. And especially the debts that must be paid, whether she could work or not. Now, I don't want to end on a negative note necessarily, but it is important to know that as Laura grew up, she did struggle with the homemaking. And so we can take comfort and know that we are not alone when we struggle with our homemaking and we can look back at the other inspiring lessons from this book series and just take what would work for us and apply them to our own lives. So this was a very in-depth uh, video, an in-depth deep dive analysis into the homemaking secrets that could be found in the Little House on the Prairie series. I hope that you really enjoyed this video. Please share this with a friend who you know loves this series because I know a lot of people hold it dear in their hearts. Make sure you look out for part two where I take a deep dive into the homemaking secrets that can be found in Farmer Boy. Until next time, thank you so much for joining me here on The Daily Connoisseur. I hope you will like this video, subscribe to my channel, and I will see you next time. Bye everyone.